Hey Ramblers, this video covers chapter 6.2 in our textbook and deals with finding antiderivatives analytically. Now when you think analytically, think algebraically. So we're going to be learning the process of finding the antiderivative of a given function. So before we start that, I wanted to go through some vocabulary. So the first term will be integration, then we're going to talk about indefinite integrals and definite integrals. Then I'll remind you of two properties that we've been talking about, and I'll want you to get in your notes seven different antiderivatives that I want you to know and just have memorized. Because as you'll see, if we know these basic antiderivatives, we can start doing more complex ones. We're going to finish the video off looking at some examples of uh, more complex uh, antiderivatives, or as we'll begin calling them, some more complex indefinite integrals or just integrals. All right, Ramblers, please pause often, take good notes, and thanks for watching. Okay, there are a few terms that we want to talk about before we uh, get into the actual process of finding an integral. And the first is going to be integration. Now, integration is just the act of finding an antiderivative of a given function. Um, then we're going to come across definite integrals. Now, a definite integral is an integral with an upper and lower limits. So we've seen these before. This is what we've been working on for the last couple of weeks. Um, we'd have the integral from a to b of f of x dx. That would be an example of a definite integral. Now a definite integral represents a number. So if you wanted to express a value, this is how you would do it. And we oppose that to an indefinite integral. An indefinite integral does not have limits, so it would be the same looking thing, but you'll notice that my, my a and b are not there, so the lower limit and the upper limit are not there. And an indefinite integral represents a family of antiderivatives, so it is not going to equal a number. So a definite integral, as you recall, equals big F of b minus big F of A. The indefinite integral is just going to equal big F of X plus C. And we'll get into, um, we'll get into the plus C uh, a little bit later. But this is an important difference between these two terms. Finding antiderivatives is a little bit like some other mathematical processes, like uh, finding a square root. For instance, if I asked you for the square root of 49, well, you'd have no trouble telling me that was 7, or the square root of 81 would equal 9. But if I asked you a number whose square root you didn't have memorized, say the square root of 137, it does have a square root, but we don't have it memorized, so we'd be at a little bit of a loss. We'd need a calculator or some other method of finding the square root. Well, it's really the same way with antiderivatives. For the most part, we're stuck with antiderivatives that we know. There are some techniques like substitution and integration by parts, which we'll learn. But for now, we're going to focus on the elementary antiderivatives. Now, before we start that, let's remind ourselves of some of the properties that we learned in the last section. That the sum or difference of the integral of two functions is just equal to the sum of each integral. Sometimes that's helpful if one of the parts of the sum is easy to integrate and the other one's not. The second is that if you have a constant like c, you can take that constant out and place it outside of the integral, and sometimes that makes it easier to integrate. Okay, from there, let's move on. Now that we've covered those two properties, let's talk about our first rule, and that is if k is a constant, then the integral of the constant is just equal to kx plus c. So let's take a look at an example. Let's say that I had the integral, and let's put some limits in here, from uh, 1 to 3 of 2. Well, that's going to equal 2x evaluated from 1 to 3, which will, of course, be 2 times 3 minus 2 times 1, which will equal 4. And that should make some sense, because if we looked at the graph, 
of y equals 2. That's just a constant function. And if you looked at the area under the graph from 1 out to 3, it would just be what well, would actually be a square, not even a rectangle. And the area would be 2 times 2, because the base would be 2, and the height would, of course, be 2. So once again, you'd get 4. So this does work. That's the first thing we should have in our notes, that if k is a constant, the integral of a constant is just equal to kx plus c. Okay, now let's take a look at the next rule, which is kind of undoes the power rule. So if we have a, a function that is raised to a power, so in other words, the variable is in the base, and the, the exponent is going to be a number we know, we just add 1 to the exponent and divide by that same exponent. Now, this works for all exponents unless x is negative 1, and we'll take a look at that in a minute. So let's take an example. Imagine that I had the integral of x to the fourth, and that's just going to equal x to the 4 plus 1 over 4 plus 1 plus c, which is, of course, x to the fifth over 5 plus c. Now that's just one example. Um, this works for almost any exponent, of course, unless that exponent equals negative 1. So let's take a look at another example. Let's say we had the integral of 1 over x cubed, which you could rewrite as x to the negative 3. Using our same formula now, we're just going to write that as x to the negative 3 plus 1 over negative 3 plus 1 plus c, which is, of course, equal to x to the negative 2 over negative 2. So the formula works so long as we don't have a negative 1 as the exponent of x. It even works if the exponent is a fraction. So this would be x to the 3 fourths dx, and that would integrate to be um, x to the 3 fourths plus 4 fourths over that same fraction, 3 fourths plus 4 fourths plus c. Well, that's going to simplify to x to the 7 fourths over 7 fourths plus c. Now, when we simplify a fraction in the denominator, the easiest way is to just flip it. So that's going to end up becoming 4 over 7 x to the 7 fourths plus c. Okay, this is an important rule to get in your notes and know that you can use it whether n, the exponent, is a positive number, a negative number, a fraction. Really anything except that the exponent can equal negative 1. The exponent can equal negative 1 because that's where we run into the absolute, I'm sorry, the uh, antiderivative of natural log. You see, if we were to rewrite this rule, 1 over x dx could be rewritten as x to the negative 1 dx. And if you try to add 1 to that, so let's put this as does not equal, but this should, just to show you what happens, that would be negative 1 plus 1 over negative 1 plus 1 plus c. Well, you can see that that's going to be a problem in the numerator. You're going to get x to the 0, and an even bigger problem in the denominator, because it's going to be over 0. Well, the good news is that this isn't true. When we have x equal to negative 1, I'm sorry, when the exponent is equal to negative 1, that could really just be, hopefully, you can recognize it as 1 over x, and that is the antiderivative of the absolute value, I'm sorry, the natural log of the absolute value of x. So another, a second rule you'll want to get in your notes. Okay, everyone's favorite integral, or derivative for that matter, is e to the x. e to the x dx is just its own integral, just as it, it's its own derivative. So the uh, integral of e to the x dx just equals e to the x plus c. And lastly, we're going to take our trig derivatives. Let's take sine first. The integral of sine is negative cosine.
cosine of x dx. And that should make sense to you because if you were to take the derivative of cosine, that equals minus sine. So if we're going to take the integral of sine, it's going to equal minus cosine. You might get the signs confused, but you just have to have just have to memorize it. Okay, of course, if we talk about sine, then we also have to talk about cosine. And the integral of cosine is just sine. Now, what about um, tangent? Well, the integral of tangent is an important integral to know, but it's not going to come up until we get into the next chapter and start learning about a method called substitution. So we will derive that this one ourselves, but not yet. The last one you should know is the integral of secant squared, because that does equal a function that comes up fairly often, and you may remember that secant squared is the derivative of tangent. So let's get that in our notes as well. Let's take a look at an example, um, just that really shows all the properties at work and how you can either do them in one step or if you get a complicated integral, you can just break it up into two steps. So I'm going to use some of the properties here. And the first one, I'm going to break up the sum of two um, integrands into two separate integrals. So the first will be the integral of 3x dx plus the integral of x squared dx. Then, just to show off the properties, I'm going to take that 3 out and put it in front of the integral. So I have 3 times the integral of x dx plus the integral of x squared dx. Now this is going to simplify to 3 times x to the second over 2, because I'm just invoking the power rule there. I'm adding 1 to the exponent and dividing by n plus 1 plus c, plus, once again, adding 1 to the exponent and dividing by um, 1 added to the exponent. And at this point, I can combine these two constants into a new constant that will, because we haven't identified what that constant is, so we just combine them into 1. We get 3x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3 plus that combined constant of c. And so that would be your family of antiderivatives for this original example. Now let's take a look at another one. Uh, suppose we had the integral of sine x plus 3 cosine x. Well, again, you could do this all in one step. You could just say, well, I know that the integral of sine x is going to be minus cosine x plus 3 times sine x plus c, and you'd be done. Or, if you wanted to, you could break it up into two separate integrals. You might find that easier as you're just learning. And maybe you even want to take that constant 3 out of the second integral. I can't forget my dx. And so you end up getting the same answer, that the derivative of sine is going to be minus cosine x plus 3 times the derivative of cosine, which is sine x. So either way, you get the same answer. One is just a little bit fewer steps. Okay, I want to take a look at one more example and see how this works when we're plugging in uh, limits to get uh, definite integrals. Okay, the process of integrating with limits is the same as the process for uh, integrating an indefinite integral, but the steps are longer. So let's, uh, let's go through this one step by step. As you can see, I used the same integrand that I had before just to make our work a little bit easier. And we know that this is going to equal minus cosine x plus 3 sine x evaluated from pi over 2 to pi. Now, you've got to be very careful as you substitute in your two limits, not to leave anything off, and be careful about distributing negatives. So this will equal, and I'm going to put parentheses around it, the negative cosine of pi plus 3 times the sine of pi. Now, I have to subtract 
my um, lower, the evaluation of the lower limit. So this becomes minus a negative cosine of pi over 2 plus 3 sine of pi over 2. Now, to get our final answer, we have to evaluate each term, and I really recommend going step by step. So if you know your first quadrant trig values, this isn't that hard. We're going to get the negative cosine of pi, which is negative 1, plus 3 times the sine of pi, which is 3 times 0, minus negative cosine of pi over 2, which is negative of 0, plus 3 times the sine of pi over 2, which is 3 times 1. So if we evaluate all of this, I get 1 minus 3, which equals negative 2. So that means that my antiderivative, negative cosine x plus 3 sine x, changed 2 units, a negative 2 units, uh, over that interval. Okay, Ramblers. So now you should know the difference between an indefinite integral, which is a family of antiderivatives, and a definite integral, which is a number. Um, you should know that the term integration means to find an antiderivative. And then you should know and, and learn and commit to memory the basic antiderivatives. So we want to cover any power function, um, a constant, the uh, antiderivative of e to the x, of natural log x, of sine of x, cosine of x, and secant squared of x. Ramblers, please be able to use the uh, two properties we discussed when you have a constant in an uh, integral and when you have two functions added together in an integral. In, in, in an integral. Sometimes we'll separate them. Okay, Ramblers, thanks for watching, and I hope this helped.